All right. These verses really did a job on me this month while I was... I just got back last night from Pennsylvania, but I typed up my notes before I left, but (laughs) obviously, (laughs) yeah, it could have been four pages long instead of two. But these verses, verse 16, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. You and I are supposed to make the most of every opportunity that we have to share Christ and to live for Christ and to shine for Christ because the days are evil. And if you look at that Greek word, which is written making the most, it's a, um, it's a marketplace word. It means to buy up, not to waste, to grab to, to get every bit that you can in your opportunity to serve him. Um, it made me think right away of when you're shopping for a sale or something's on sale. I like to drink Coke Zero, okay? <laughs> and every time Coke Zero is on sale in one of the stores, my daughter will text me and say, Mom, it's, it's on sale at Target, or it's on sale at Hy-Vee, or it's on sale wherever. So I, um, I almost always shop at Hy-Vee, and I, only because I'm a person of habit and it's right there close to me. But I was watching TV one time, and it said that Fairway had Coke Zero on sale. So I thought, well, I need to venture out and go to Fairway, which I had never been to, even though it's just down the road. Anyway, and the thing I liked about it was when I shop at Hy-Vee, they limit me. They tell me I can only usually buy two of what it is that I want. But the advertisement for Fairway said, no limit. So I go to Fairway, and I fill my card up with Coke Zero. And I'm checking out because it was a really good sale. Don't judge me. Anyway, so I'm, I'm checking out, and this guy that's checking me out goes, well, someone's having a party. And I go, no, it's all for me. <laughs> and then the funny thing about that was I'd never shopped at Fairway before. And I didn't know they follow you out and put your groceries in your car. So this guy's following me. <laughs> and I'm like, this is creepy. <laughs> It it took me a while to figure out. Finally, I turned around, I looked at him, and I said, are you with me? And he goes, yes, ma'am, I want to put your your Coke Zero away for you. Anyway, and then he had some uh, questions about all my (laughs) stash. But that's exactly what this word is talking about. If there is an opportunity, buy it up. Buy, use everything you can, because you never know if you're going to have that opportunity again. And um, obviously, when there's sales in the stores, they're limited, like, you know, one day or two days or whatever. So that's exactly the same idea. Don't waste your time. Buy it up. Use every opportunity you have. And then look for the word, they're evil. We're going to look at that a little deeper on the back. But the word there in the Greek for evil, he's, it's, he's saying Make most, buy up every opportunity because these days in which we're living are so evil. And the word there for evil, usually when you think of evil, well, it's duh, right? It's something bad, sinful. But that particular word for evil means active evilness trying to oppose good. So it's just not doing evil for evil's sake but doing evil to oppose what is good. And it made me think of our society and the way our society is today, how not only do we see evil around us, but we see the attack on good, that things that are godly are condemned and thought to be evil. And so that's really the word that it's talking about there. That's the kind of evil, the kind of evil that opposes good, not just does evil for its own purposes, but does evil to oppose good. There's a quote here from Ray Stedman, friend of yours, Ellen. (laughs) 
<laughs> but he says that word in the Greek is a word for the marketplace. You go down to your supermarket, you look for a bargain because you know they will not last long. They're past cheap. They're, they therefore make the most of, every, of all of them, buy them up. This is exactly what the word Paul employs here. Buy up the opportunities which are created, in our case, by the evil days. And we've talked a lot when we were talking about the scripture tells us to let our light shine. And obviously the darker the darkness, the brighter the shining, right? The bright, it sticks out. Charles Swindoll said, life is brief, a very tiny slice in light of eternity. Jesus had 33 years. He finished his work. You might have 50. You might have 87. Don't waste your breath. Forgive us, Lord, for being bored in the midst of our magnificent creation, of your magnificent creation. That first, that quote really got to me because what he is saying is we can live our life so humdrum. Like I get up, I, this is what I do, this is my routine, I go to work or I do this, and we act as if there's no immediacy to what we're doing. That these days, that life is short, that we don't know how many days we're going to have to serve him, that we can act like it's very mundane, and that's Charles Swindoll's point. We looked at this verse last time, but I knew I had to put it in here again. Psalm 90, verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. One of the attributes of wisdom is that I understand my life is short. I don't care if you live to be 100 years old. Your life is short in light of all of eternity, right? So buy up every opportunity. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 says, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead where you are going, there's neither working nor planning. That kind of sounds a little dreary, but basically what he's saying there, whatever you... Put your hands to whatever you're going to do. Do your very best at it. Put your hands on it. Do it with all your might. Because he makes the point here, listen, you're all going to (laughs) die. That's what it's saying. We have one life that the Lord's given us to serve him. Make the very best of it. Because one day, whether it's the rapture or whether we die, our opportunity to share Christ with the unsaved world will be done. We have one opportunity to do that. Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not human masters. I love that. Look at the superlatives here. Whatever you do, do with all your might. Whatever you work at, work at it with all your heart. The next verse is going to say, make the most of every opportunity. But back to Colossians 3.23, you know what? Sometimes we get real excited about what we want to do for the Lord, and other people might not be as excited as we are, Aaliyah. (laughs) Or, you know, you're on a team. You're you're working on the team, or you're working in a WAN, or you're working at the uh, sports camp this week, or whatever you're doing, and... Sometimes other people don't appreciate our labor, but this verse says, you know, what doesn't matter? Who are you doing it for? You're doing it for him. And he always appreciates what we do for him. So it's like, don't don't even act like you're working for some human master, whether it's a job and an employee or even in a Christian situation. We can get, you know, well, boy, nobody appreciated me or nobody said thank you and I put all this effort into it or whatever. But we make it all about us instead of him. Because he says, make the most of every opportunity. Be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Colossians 4, 5 is very pointedly saying, watch how you talk in front of unbelievers. Watch how you act in front of unbelievers. Because they're watching. Trust me, they're watching. If you've ever tried to share Christ with someone, I guarantee you, you've had somebody say, well, those Christians. 
Uh, they do this or they, they watch. And it's our responsibility to live wisely, make the most of every opportunity to share Christ. John 9, 4. Jesus is talking and he says, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me, because night is coming when no one can work. That's another way of saying what? You're all going to (laughs) die. That's exactly what Ecclesiastes said. Whether it's the rapture or whether it's I, my human body dies, I only am given so much time to serve him. And I better be very intentional about the way that I live my life. Romans 13, 11. And do this, understanding the, the present time, it should be, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. What the Spirit of God is pay, saying through Paul here is, hey, wake up. There's work to be done. Don't you understand there's a world around you that's dying without Christ? Don't live your life so nonchalantly. Wake up. Obviously, he's not talking about literal physical sleeping. He's talking about spirituality. And it made me think, I was saved at the age of 10. And now I'm 76 years old. So I have had 67 years to serve him. Think about that. However many years the Lord has given you to serve him, how well have you done that? How intentional have you been to serve him? I don't care how old you are. Your salvation or eternity is closer to you now than when you first believed, right? When you first got saved, when you first accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, today you're nearer to your salvation than you were then the final salvation in heaven. So use that time wisely. 1 Corinthians 7.29, Paul says, What I mean, brothers and sisters, is this. Time is short. Time is short. And that's what all of these verses are saying. I mean, the days my... I I remember, uh, I think one of the best quotes I ever heard, especially raising kids, was, The days are long... (laughs) <laughs> but the years are short. It, 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 you know, you have those days when you think, will this day ever end? And then the years just fly by. They just fly by. Psalm 39, verses 4 and 5, David is talking. And he says, show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. And everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Look at that verse. First of all, what's a handbreadth? The handbreadth is just what you think it is. It's the, he goes, my life is this big, is what he's saying. It made me think of I usually, when I'm talking, I'll say, your life is this big and eternity is this long. But he said it's, and when they, with the Hebrew language, when they talked about measuring with a handbreadth, it was your four fingers minus your thumb. So it was, this was the length. And the point that David is making is, my life is short. Help me realize that, Lord. Help me realize that I only have so much time to serve you. And then look at this last line. Everyone is but a breath. Even those who seem secure. We had Vicki Reed was at Bible study this afternoon. We had a crowd in here. We had 25 ladies. There was the only empty chairs in the room were right there. And, um, and sweet Vicki, and if you don't know Vicki, she has acute leukemia. Her, her, well, you know, every day is a gift for anybody. But when you think in light of Vicki, she's looking at the end. So it says, everyone is by the breath, even those who seem secure. So even, I mean, I look at this young group over here, and I go, the chances are, you're included. (laughs) Sorry, Shirley, I'm skipping you. But even 
even though they seem secure. In other words, what Paul is saying, some of you look really healthy. It looks like death isn't close at hand. Or you look really young. It looks like you have a lot of years to serve. That's what he's saying there. He said, every, all of you, listen up. Your life is just a breath. Even though it seems by all odds you're going to live a long time. You don't have any, you don't have cancer. You don't have leukemia. You don't have, you're young. He says, no, even those who seem secure, your life is but a breath. Job 9, 25 and 26. Job said, my names are swifter than a runner. They fly away without a glimpse of joy. They skim past like boats of papyrus, like eagles swooping down on their prey. Life is short. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. This, is, this gets me. You always know how the spirit is working in me because I underline. <laughs> Obviously, this is all God's word, and it's all important, but when I get my little underline out, you know that the Holy Spirit is really speaking to me. 1 Corinthians fifteen ten. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. I want my salvation to affect every part of my life. I want it to affect everything I say, everything I do, everything I plan. That's what Paul is saying. He said, the salvation and the grace that I received from God was not without effect. It affected everything about me. He said, I know I worked harder than all of them. And then he says, yet not I, but it was the grace of God that was within me. And the whole point there is give your all for him and allow his spirit to do its work and flow from you. I'm sorry, I didn't put it in here, but I could put 2 Peter chapter 1 in every one of our Bible studies. But if you remember, and you should by now because I keep repeating it, but in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter is saying this. He's saying, unless these attributes of the Holy Spirit are increasing in your life, not just evident in your life, but increasing in your life, you're going to be ineffective and unproductive in your walk with the Lord. He says, if, if you don't love more today than you did yesterday, if you don't have more self-control today than you did yesterday, if, he said, not only should these qualities be present in your life, but if they're not present in increasing measure, you're going to end up being ineffective and unproductive. So you look at that Peter saying, I don't want to be ineffective and unproductive. And you see Paul saying, it had a great effect on me. And that's what we want. And then if you went on, it's not in your notes, but if you went on in Second Peter chapter 1, he not only says you'll be ineffective and unproductive, but he says you'll be blind and nearsighted. You'll be blind to all the opportunities that are around you where God wants you to jump in and do something. You'll be blind to every opportunity. If we're not, if we're not walking and spending time with the Lord and listening to his spirit, we're going to miss out on so many opportunities he has for us to do. And then we're nearsighted. We're just looking at today. We're not looking at eternity. We're not always looking farsighted. We're looking with eternity in view. And it's really easy to just get caught up in the mundane jobs that you have to do to exist. I mean, you got to vacuum the rug. You got to wash the dishes. You got to feed the baby. I mean, but he says, don't just focus on that. Look at eternity and what he wants you to do. And then to, to walk in line with him. I know I've shared this experience before, but it, it had such an effect on me that I'll share it again. But I... You know, I was at the, I don't always give to people who beg for money. You don't even know where the money's going and all that. Um, but I was in the parking lot. This, I was in, see, uh, live, living in Washington State. And this lady comes up to me and she says, you know, my, my son needs medicine. And could you give me a couple dollars toward the medicine? And I was very sweet with her. I was very kind with her. And I was honest. I said, I don't, I don't have cash. I don't have a, I don't have a dollar to my, you know cash to give you and um 
got in my car, and it wasn't audible, but trust me, the Lord just said to me, Sharon, you have a credit card and you have a checkbook. Get your butt. The Lord doesn't talk like that, does he? Get your butt out of the car and go find this lady. I mean, I just, it was so strong to me that I did. I got out of my car. I go find the lady. I said, hey, hey, come with me. I'll, I'll buy your medicine, uh, whatever it is that your son needs. So we go in, and I don't know, it was 25 bucks or something like that, but I paid for her medicine. She was telling the truth. That's what she wanted the money for. And, um, you know, she was very grateful, and she said, oh, I'll pay you back. And I said, no, it's, it's a gift. Don't worry about it. And then the very next day was meet the teacher at school. And guess who walked in my room? I mean, if that's not a God thing. (laughs) I mean, when I saw her walk in the door, I'm like, thank you, Lord. I mean, I I wasn't mean to her the first time she talked to me. But I'm like, so that's how I want, I want to live my life so I'm in tune with him. And so when he's laying on my heart for me to do something, that I do it. And I don't say, well, next time someone asks me, maybe I should keep a $5 bill in the glove. No, just get out of your car and go do it. Anyway, she looked at me. I looked at her. She gave me a hug. And, and it was interesting. You teachers in the room will understand this, but... Uh, Some of the teachers came up to me afterwards and you go, oh, you've got the mother from hell in your classroom. (laughs) And I'm like, and I, she wasn't, she was, she was the angel. (laughs) Um, Obviously because of what the Lord had planned out. And in the middle of the year, she called me on the phone and she said, I understand your church has a boys and girls club. Could you pick up Dougie and take him with you to, I'm like, sure. And he got saved. And I'm like, what? Because, you know, I need to understand that God knows everything. He knew exactly what I needed to do. He knew exactly how it was going to turn out. And I needed to listen. And I'm not telling you I say yes to everybody who, because I don't. There was another time I'm at the gas station. This young man comes up to me and he's like, Kid, I, I'm out of gas and I don't have any money for gas. And I just felt compelled to like, So I filled his car up with gas, and he and I, it was dark outside, and he and I walk into the gas station together, and I'm going to pay my bill. And he goes, Mrs. Feather? (laughs) He was one of my students, previous students. We didn't, I mean, out in the dark, I didn't know it was him. He didn't know it was me. But I'm telling you that the Lord has work he wants us to do, and I think of, makes me think of how many times I missed those opportunities. Like I felt a a compulsion to help somebody or do something, and I ignored it or I put it off. I thought, boy, what have I missed out on that God wanted to do, that he wanted to do through me? Because it's all of him. Second Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. As God's co-workers, we urge you to receive God's, you not to receive God's grace in vain. Doesn't that just go with first, second Peter chapter 1? He says, look what I've done for you. Don't waste, don't, don't waste it. Share it, share it, share it. Paul is an example for all of us, 2 Timothy 4, 7. He says, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. We need to not spend our days focusing on us, but focusing on him. And not necessarily what's good for me, or what makes me feel good, or what makes me feel happy. But what does he want to do? We can't do it all. You can't give to every person that wants. You'll be bankrupt if you give money to every person that asks you for money. You can't serve in every uh, opportunity that the, the Spirit of God opens up for you to serve. Now, I talked to the young ones. Now we'll talk to the old, the old ladies here. <laughs> we don't want to be those people who say, well, you know, I've served my time. I, I served for a long time. Now it's time for the young girls to step up and do whatever. You don't retire from serving him. It might look different, 
what you, the way you're serving might be in a different area, but we can't stop serving him because he wants us to be involved. We want, he wants us to be able to say, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. I can't even imagine to hear out of the voice of Jesus, well done, (laughs) that good and faithful servant. Can you imagine those words? Because the days are evil. The fact that the times in which we live are morally corrupt is a strong reason to take every opportunity to shine for Christ. If you're one of the younger ladies here tonight, you might not realize what we realize in that this world in our lifetime has gotten more and more and more wicked and more and more evil. And he said, that's an opportunity for you to shine for me. Thomas Brooks says, time is not yours to dispose of as you please. We are accountable to God. The devil makes all haste that he can to outwork the children of light in a speedy dispatch of deeds of darkness because he knows his time is short. He'll not let slip by any opportunity to do mischief. Oh, that we would have that same desire to work that hard. And then that word evil, which I mentioned before, it's an active opposition to the good. It's not just doing bad things but it's actively opposing everything that stands for righteousness and good. Galatians 1, 3 through 4. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. Luke 17, 26 says, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. But mark this, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4. There will be terrible times in the last days. You say, well, Sharon, how do you know that we're living in the last days? Nobody knows when Christ is going to return. Well, the scripture is very clear on what the last days are. The last days began with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in the scheme of all eternity, if you are living after the resurrection, you are living in the last days. He says, mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Check. Lovers of money. Check. Boastful. Check. Proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The one that jumped out to me so much, well, a couple of them did. One of them is ungrateful because I just see in the scripture so often how it tells us to be thankful. But not lovers of good. Things that stand for righteousness, people hate today. A man should marry a woman. Precious babies should not be aborted. Things that are by any standard good are not loved and embraced today by our world system. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We were talking about that after class this afternoon. And we need to understand that we're in a spiritual battle. Paul, when he talks about prayer, he says, I wrestle in prayer. Satan does not want you to pray. He does not want you to be a prayer warrior. That's, be, that's why every time you set aside time to pray, your mind wonders, do I got to do this, or have I done that, or I need to make sure he's going to attack. It's been said that if you don't realize you're in a spiritual battle, you're losing it. Because think of... Say that this, this might not be encouraging to you, but the closer you try to walk with the Lord, the more Satan will attack. 
Like if you're not really serving him, he's like, well, I don't have to worry about her. <laughs> she's, she's in her own agenda. It's when we seek to serve him that he attacks the most. And then I think it helps us if we understand what this verse is talking about. The people are not our enemy. Even people who do harmful things to us. The enemy is Satan. He might be using people to hurt us. He may be using people to discourage us. But they're not the enemy. Satan's the enemy. Matthew 24, 10 through 12. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and many false prophets will appear. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. When I read that, I thought, oh, Lord, don't let that be me. Don't let my love grow cold. You know, in the book of Revelation, this isn't in your notes, but in the book of Revelation, as you're, I'm sure you're well aware, they talk about the seven churches. And some commentators believe that those seven churches represent errors of church history. Maybe they do. At least they're talking about specific churches. And if you remember when he talks to the church of Ephesus, he commends them at a lot of things. You're good at doing this. Yeah, you're doing that. You're busy doing that. But he says, what? I have one thing against you. Remember what it was? You've lost your first love. You've lost your passion for me. It used to be you love me more than yourself. It used to be you love me more than anything. Now you're going through the motions. You're serving. But you no longer love me like you used to love me. And then he talks to the church of Laodicea. And he goes, you guys think you're doing great. You know, I don't know. You got the nice big church and people are coming. He says, but, but you're not. You're naked and you're blind. And that's where he talks about the fact that, um, he says, I wish you were hot or cold. I remember when I was little, that verse confused me because I thought, why would he want me to be cold? But it, it's, it's looking at it in this light, like a, a, a drink, a hot drink is very refreshing. And a cold drink is very refreshing. But a lukewarm one might gag you. Like if you have a cup of, I'm not a coffee drinker, but you have a cup of coffee and you think it's good and hot and you take a swig and you're like, He said, it gags him. Well, let's try to get this one done in 10 minutes. (laughs) Ephesians 5, 17. He says, therefore, what is the therefore, therefore? He's saying, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You know what I especially when I'm studying and and trying to prepare, I'm like, wait a minute. In verse 15, we spent a lot of time talking about what was wise and unwise. And now you're going to throw, don't be foolish at me. (laughs) And then you dig in and you go, whoa, he's talking not in the same sense of wise and unwise, although that's some of it. But if you look at the word used for foolish here, it's without reflection of wisdom, without reason, ignorant, egotistic so Paul through the spirit of God is saying a foolish person is very self-centered and egotistical so instead of looking for every opportunity to serve what am I doing I'm looking at what makes me happy what makes me feel good that's the foolishness he's talking about here wow The Bible says that the fool says in his heart, there's no God. However, as a believer, I can be foolish. I can be self-centered. I can think of myself before I think about him. I can put my reasoning above God's. I can think I know better than he does. Now, I know that there's nobody in this room who would look at me and say, Sharon, you know what? I think I have a better idea than God does. I know you wouldn't say it, and I wouldn't say it, but sometimes we act like that. Well, I know the Bible says this, but maybe... Well, I know I'm supposed to do this, but... That's the foolishness that it's talking about here. To think I have a better idea, or I know what's better than God does. 
Those who trust in themselves, according to Proverbs 28, 26, those are fools. I think of, it's not in your notes, but I think of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You, you could probably all quote it to me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and what? Lean not into your own understanding. Because what I think doesn't matter. What you think doesn't matter. What matters is what God says. That's what I can trust. That's what I can lean into. 1 Corinthians 13, 19, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. 1 Corinthians 2, that's a 14 I tried to scribble in for you. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. He's talking about the difference between a believer and a non-believer in that verse. I don't want to lead you astray. That's what he's talking about. But as I read that, it made me think of the verses it talks about as believers we can quench the Holy Spirit. We can stop his effectiveness in our lives. And by the same token, when the spirit doesn't have freedom in me and I'm reading his word, it can distort it. I can make me say whatever. We can be foolish. Galatians 3, 3. Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? The Galatians had accepted Christ, the Jewish people had accepted Christ, and they understood it was by faith alone, but it took no time at all for them to go, well, you know, I think really you still need to be circumcised, and I still think you need to keep this feast day, and I think you need to... What they thought, not what the Word of God says. And we can be the same way. We can say, well, you know, look what I did. Look what I think. Look what I want. Proverbs 18.2. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but they delight in airing their own opinions. Ego. Do you see how, how that word, that Greek word for fool, is just over and over again in these verses talking about self and ego and thinking that perhaps I know more than God does. Proverbs 14, 16. A fool is hot-headed and yet feels secure. Proverbs 12, 15 through 16. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Fools show annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. I couldn't ignore these verses because the scripture teaches that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. <laughs> Kids are born fools. <laughs> they, they are. They're, bo- they're born self-centered, right? Me, 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 my, my, my. And it's the parent's responsibility to help train the children that they shouldn't be self-centered. Proverbs 22, uh, 15, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Proverbs 15, 5, a fool spurns a parent's discipline, but whoever heeds correction shows prudence. I think I shared a little bit last time um, when I was preparing to speak to the mother-daughter tea in, um, at Generation Church. I was trying to show the ladies the difference between a proverb and a promise. And we talked about that. That a proverb means the likeliness of something happening. Like train up a child in the way he will go and he won't depart from it. In other words, the chances of your kids being godly are much better if you train them godly than not. But man has a free will. So it's not a promise that they will. We all know of godly families who have wayward children, right? And so... um, as I was looking at that and thinking of that, and then I went to Hebrews chapter 12, and this isn't in your notes either, but in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about the fact that we are children and that God is our parent and that because he loves us, he disciplines us. And then when you get down to about a verse 11 or 12, he says, 
But righteousness is the result of discipline if we're willing to be trained by it. In other words, with the perfect parent who is God, will discipline result in righteousness? Only if I'm willing to be trained by it. You know, you think of the word of God, which says, you know, the word of God is powerful and it's good for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. So I have the perfect parent, God. I have the perfect manual, the word of God. Does that mean I'm going to walk in righteousness? No. I have to be willing to be trained by him. I need to be willing to be trained by the word of God. I need to be willing to submit to it. Warren Wearsby, he says, don't miss the mark. Don't miss the road. Don't end up suffering on some detour. How foolish to stumble along through life and never seek to know his will. As we obey his will, we buy up the opportunities and we won't waste our time our energy, our money, and our talents. Wearsby in this quote is connecting verse 16 with verse 17. Verse 16 says, make, make, make the most of every single opportunity you have. And then in verse 17 it says what? Therefore don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So how do I know what the Lord's will is? There's a lot of times we try to make decisions. I mean, I think of major times in my life, like, should I marry this guy? Should I go to this college? Should I accept this position? Should I do whatever? And I don't know about you, but anytime I'm confronted with that, I try to spend a lot of time praying about it, seeking his direction. But believe it or not, he doesn't send me a postcard and say, Sharon, do this. He doesn't audibly say to me, this is what you should do. But I think after we spend time in the word and we spend time in prayer and maybe counsel from others or whatever, then I, what my manner has always been after waiting on him is when I feel I know what he wants. But then, I'm, but then you, ju- you, you question yourself, like, is this Satan trying to tempt me? Is this Satan trying to dissuade me? So I always say, Lord... This is what I think you want me to do. But I trust you, if I'm wrong, slam that door in my face. (laughs) And he's done that a number of times. Just slam that door shut. I think this is what you want me to do, but if not, I'm trusting you to do that. But there's a lot of things in the Bible that we know are God's will. It doesn't, I can't give you a verse to say what college a person should go to or who they should marry or whatever. But there's so many times he directly tells us what his will is. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world. That's his will. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. He said, listen, saturate yourself with my word. Saturate yourself with time and prayer with me, and I will make it obvious to you what my will is. First Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you. I don't, have to, I don't have to wonder. Something disappoints me. Something is hard. Something, I don't like it. The scripture says, you know what God's will is? Be thankful. Okay, God, you're going to teach me something through this. I'm not thankful for that thing, but I'm thankful that I can trust God because he tells us we'll never mature without hardship. The scripture tells us that, so I can be thankful. Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good, everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Kind of reminds me of what Paul said when he says, I work harder than all, but it really wasn't me working. It was him working in me. And how am I going to be equipped to do every good work according to his will? I'm going to love this book. 
I'm going to spend time in this book. I'm going to know this book. That's what equips me. He equips me. 1 Peter 2.15, For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. It's always God's will to do the right thing, to be right and do right. And according to this verse, if you're accused of something, no one's going to believe it because of your life. But trust me, they may believe it for a time. (laughs) That doesn't matter. It's always right to do right. That's what God says his will is, to do good. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 4. It is God's will that you be sanctified. You know what sanctified means? It means to be holy, to be set apart. It's always God's will to do right. It's always God's will to be holy. It's always God's will not to do sin, what he calls sin. That's always his will. I don't have to say, Lord, uh, I, I'm, I'm seeking your will whether I should have this affair or not. No, you don't have to pray about things. like He says, no, I'll tell you right now, this is, I don't have to pray. Lord, should I kill this person? Should I rob this bank? No. He says, listen, you know it's my will to be godly. By the same token, is it his will that I'm bitter? Is it his will that I say what I want to say instead of what God wants me to say. I mean, we all said, well, no, he doesn't want you to rob a bank. No, he doesn't want you to kill somebody. No, he doesn't want you to have an affair. Does he want you to hold a grudge in your heart? No, he doesn't. In fact, if you remember, I think it was chapter 3 of Ephesians, he says when we do that, you know what we do? We open our heart to Satan when we're, we're holding animosity towards someone. But do you know what they did, Sharon? It doesn't matter. I need to forgive. Doesn't make what they did right. Doesn't make them excuse what they did. Not at all. It's what happens inside of me. Because when I hold on to anger and I hold on to bitterness, I open my heart to Satan. And the word says it's God's will that you be sanctified, that you be obedient to him. (laughs) If it's not my favorite verse, it's probably close. If you look through your notes, you'll probably see it a hundred times. Micah 6, 8. He's shown you, O mortal, what is good. I love this verse for so many reasons. But it's like, you don't have to ask. He's already told you. He's already told you what he wants you to do. And according to Micah 6, 8, to act justly, that means to act righteously, to do the right thing, to love mercy... We've talked about that. Yes, I love God's mercy to me, but in this verse, he's saying, you love being merciful. Anytime you've been hurt, you can say, wow, God, bless your heart. You've given me an opportunity to show mercy. That's really what that means. And to walk humbly with your God. What is God's will? God's will is that my mind is renewed by his word. It's God's will that I read his word so I'm equipped to serve him. It's God's will that I do good. It's God's will that I be thankful. It's God's will that I be sanctified. There's so many things we don't have to wonder about. It's God's will that I be humble. It's God's will that I love mercy. It's God's will. Colossians 1, 9b. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. I love that. That's a good thing to pray for your friends, for yourself, for your children. Lord, fill them with the knowledge of your will. Psalm 40, verse 8. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is written on my heart. In other words, what the psalmist is saying is, I know what your will is because you've written it down and I want to obey it. Teach me to do your will for you are my God. James four fifteen. He says, instead, you ought to say, and you know the context of this. He's saying, some of us, we say, well, I'm going to do this tomorrow. Then on Friday, I'm going to do this. And next Thursday, I'm going to do this. He goes, you better say, if God wills. And not just as a, you know, it's real easy to say that. God willing, but to really mean it. But he says, instead, you should say, if it's the Lord's will, we will do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes All such boasting is evil. What he's talking about here is that foolishness. That foolishness to think 
it's my responsibility to make the plan and not ask God if he has a different plan than mine. It's very, that's the ego again. Like, I, have I even sought wisdom from him to know if this is what I should do? And then I thought I'd end with the, the verses here because obviously when he's talking about make the best of every opportunity because the days are evil, the focus is on sharing Christ with a lost world, living and shining for him. That's his will. And we know what God's will is, 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved. That's his will. And we get to be involved in that. We get to be his ambassadors. We get to beg people, to entreat people, Paul says, to, to, to implore people to come to him. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. There was a lot of t- at the time of the apostles where they go, Oh, yeah, you said Jesus is coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He hasn't come back. Yeah. I... I have a friend, I think I probably told you that, um, from Seattle, and he said, Hey, Sharon, when the Lord comes back, you want me to water your plants for you? Hmm. I was waiting for the lightning bolt, but it didn't, it didn't happen. But that, to understand that the scripture says he's returning and to act so flippantly, But that's what he's talking about here. People say, well, you know, when's he coming? When's he coming? He's not going to come. And the scripture says the only reason he hasn't already come is why. He wants more people to come to know his son, his savior. John 6, 40. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. I don't know about you. I've spent a lot more time in these two verses. (laughs) This month, I know than you have, but the more I look at them, the more I'm like, whoa, I don't want to waste time. What am I doing with the time that he's given me? I don't know. I I don't know that I have tomorrow. You don't know that you have tomorrow. That we're going to make the most of every opportunity to share Christ, to live out our Christian life before others, before our children, before our grandchildren, before our nieces and nephews. I spent time this week with one of my nieces and nephews who don't know the Lord. What did I do with that time? Did I spend time talking about spiritual things? Don't be foolish. Don't make you the center of your life. Make him the center of your life. And spend time knowing what his will is. And listening to him when he lays it on our hearts and not put it off, but do it. Lord, I thank you for so much for who you are. I thank you for your word and the truth in your word. Lord, I'm humbled by how often I fail you. And Lord, you know my heart's desire is to be passionate for you, to love you, to make you the love of my life. That's what I want, Lord. I want to be conformed to the image of your son. Help us, Lord, in our daily lives with so many things calling for our attention and our time to make sure we prioritize the main thing, and that is to know you, to know your word, to shine for you, and to take every opportunity that you give us to share your, you with the world and to be example, Lord, of godliness even to those who know you. In Christ's name, amen.